this video, we'll be looking at St. Thomas Aquinas and Augustine's definition of sin and Aquinas's division of sin into mortal and venial sins. Technically speaking, anything at all can sin if it can fail to do something correctly. For instance, if a tree grows roots which fail to reach water underground, then the tree has sinned in the technical sense of the word. Likewise, if a bird grows a wing that is too short, resulting in the bird not being able to fly well, then the bird sinned, again in the technical sense of the word sin. Likewise, every time a human trips or stubs his or her toe, this is also a sin in the strict sense of the word, even though the person did not do this thing voluntarily. Usually, however, when we use the word sin, what we really mean is moral fault, in Latin, culpa. Moral fault is a special kind of sin in which the failure is a. Voluntary, and b. Contrary to the moral law. For instance, when a bird grows a defective wing or when a person stubs his toe, this is a sin in the technical sense, but it isn't voluntary. Likewise, when a good painter chooses, of his own will, to make an ugly painting, this too is a sin in the technical sense of the word. Moreover, it is a voluntary sin. Still, it isn't a moral fault because it isn't contrary to the moral law. Finally, theft is a sin in the technical sense, and since theft is both voluntary and contrary to the moral law, theft is that special kind of sin which we call moral fault. Although, technically speaking, sin is a broader category than moral fault, including such things as birth defects in birds, as we just saw, since this is an ethics course, when we use the word sin, we will usually mean moral fault, which is a special kind of sin, technically speaking. So usually when you see the word sin in this course, just think moral fault, even though under some circumstances we will use the word sin in the broader sense, which includes such things as the birth defects of birds. Now, what is the definition of sin in this restricted sense, that is, moral fault? In other words, what's the definition of moral fault? A moral fault is defined as a bad human action. Now let's break down this definition into its component parts. First of all, let's explain what's meant by human act or human action. This is an action of a human that is voluntary. Now, digesting food, stubbing one's toe, and snoring while asleep are actions belonging to a human, but they aren't called human actions because they aren't voluntary. An action is voluntary if it is under the control of the will. Now, there are two sorts of things under the control of the will commissions, which are positive actions, and omissions, which are the failure to act. act. Commissions are actions elicited by the will directly, such as love, hatred, choice, and intention, or external actions under the command of the will. For instance, uh, what you say out loud is not something elicited by the will directly, but it's something that's a positive external action under the control of the will. This is also true of other bodily deeds. On the other hand, omissions are things under the control of the will in the sense that the will could have done something, but failed to do so. So when something is not done in uh, the sense of an action immediately elicited by the will, or external actions that could have been commanded by the will, then we call that absence of an action an omission specifically a voluntary omission. So, not all human acts are actually positive actions, since some of them are omissions, some commissions. Commissions are positive actions, and omissions are the failure to act when one could have acted. So, when we say moral fault is a bad human act, we're including both positive actions as well as the failure to act when you could have acted. Now let's look at the other part of the definition of moral fault, namely bad or evil. In Latin, the words bad and evil are not distinguished. They're both malus, 
Now, something is called bad or evil if it's contrary to the eternal law. Now, it's called bad if it's contrary to the standard or measure for how that thing should be. For instance, a watch is bad if it doesn't tell time. A house is bad if it doesn't keep out the rain. The idea in our mind of what a watch or house ought to be is the law by which we measure the goodness or badness of a watch or house. So too, a human action is bad if it is contrary to the eternal law, which is the reason of God, which includes the idea of human nature and of how humans ought to act. But we don't have direct knowledge of the eternal law since we can't intuit the mind of God. So how are we to know if an action is bad, that is, against the eternal law? In practice, we determine if a human action is bad or good by seeing whether it is contrary to the natural law, which is known by natural reason, the divine law, which is revealed by God and found within sacred scripture, and the human law, which is promulgated by human rulers. As we discuss in another video, natural, divine, and human law are all participations in and partial revealings of the eternal law. They are the practical means by which we know what is contained in the eternal law. An action may be voluntary even if you aren't motivated by the action itself. The motivation for the action is the aspect of the action that makes it appealing or desirable to us. The voluntariness of an action depends on whether or not the action was within our control to do or not to do. Here's some examples. Lancelot commits adultery with Guinevere. Adultery is sexual relations with someone else's spouse. Lancelot was motivated by Guinevere's beauty, not by her being someone else's spouse. Nevertheless, his committing adultery was voluntary since it was within his control to do. Similarly, a ship captain, in a storm, throws his cargo overboard to prevent the boat from sinking. The captain certainly was not motivated by losing his precious cargo. This was a painful thing for him to do. He was motivated by the desire to survive. Nevertheless, his throwing the car cargo overboard was indeed voluntary. In general, all moral faults, that is sins, are voluntary, but no one is motivated by an action's being sinful as such. In other words, one can commit a sin without wanting to sin as such. Indeed, it is impossible for you to want to sin as such. Rather, a person sins when he wants to do something that is a sin, but without wanting its sinfulness. The sin is voluntary, but the sinfulness is not our motivation. Okay, so now that we've explained the nature of sin in general, that is, moral fault in general, let's look at the division of sin into mortal and venial sin. First of all, let's look at etymology. A wound or sickness is called mortal, or fatal, because it causes death. So too, we call certain sins mortal metaphorically because they cause spiritual death. Now, bodily death does not come from a sickness or wound in the appendages, such as the arms, legs, or hands. Rather, physical death results from a sickness or wound in the principle of life in the body. For instance, from a heart attack, blood loss, or brain injury, or from some infection coming from the appendages into one of those principles of life, like the heart or brain. The heart, the blood, and the brain are bodily principles of human life. If they fail, so too does human life. Just as there is a principle of bodily human life, so too there is a principle of human action. When there is a sin regarding that principle of human action, then we call that sin mortal inasmuch as it results in spiritual death of the sinner, the death of 
the sinners through losing that principle of life, that principle of human action. So, mortal sins are moral faults concerning the very principle or heart of human action. But what is the principle of human action? The principle of human action is the end apprehended by the intellect, namely happiness, since everything the will does is for the sake of happiness. But the will, by nature, necessarily moves towards what the intellect perceives to be the happiness of the one willing. Therefore, a person cannot directly sin with respect to his own private happiness. Nevertheless, every individual human is a part of a larger society, which has its own higher end in communal happiness. For instance, the family is directed towards domestic happiness, and civil society is directed towards the civil common good. Likewise, humanity as a whole is ordered towards the continuation of the species, and the universe is ordered towards God himself, the Creator. Although the will naturally moves towards what the intellect perceives to be the happiness of the one willing, the will must be taught to prioritize the common good of civil society, of the human species, and of the universe to its own private good. The habit of ordering one's private good to the common good is the virtue of general justice with respect to civil society and of charity with respect to the common good of the universe, which is God. Therefore, mortal sins are those that go against charity or justice. So, mortal sins are contrary to general justice or charity, which are the two virtues ordering us to the common good, that is, the good that is higher than our own private happiness. But what does it mean for a sin to be contrary to a virtue? Pretend that there is a virtue which orders us to attend the football game, which is from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. There is no such virtue, but just pretend for the moment that there is. Now consider the following actions. 1. Watching the football game. 2. Driving to the football game. 3. Having a beer at the football game. 4. Getting dressed in your team's jersey. 5. Getting a good night's sleep the day before the football game. 6. Watching a movie the night before the football game. 7. Leaving your wallet at home before leaving for the football game. 8. Pulling an all-nighter the day before the football game. 9. Taking a nap at 2.45 p.m. and not setting an alarm. 10. Going to dinner at a sit-down restaurant at 2.45 p.m. 11. Taking your car to the body shop to be re uh, repainted at 2.45 p.m. 12. Going to a three-hour movie at 3 p.m. These actions fall into three broad categories. Acts of virtue. Here, of course, we're talking about this made-up virtue of going to the football game. Acts unrelated to the virtue. And acts opposed to the virtue. Now, under acts of the virtue, we first find the proper act of the virtue itself. This is designated in purple. We also find an act necessary for the proper act of the virtue. So, for instance, watching the football game is the act proper to the virtue itself, but driving to the football game is an act necessary for the proper act of the virtue. Finally, we also find an act that improves the proper act of the virtue without being strictly necessary. These are things like having a beer at the game, getting dressed in your team's jersey, and getting a good night's sleep before the game. All of these things improve or um, make better the quality of the proper act of the virtue, but they aren't strictly necessary for it. You're going to have a better time at the game if you have a beer, if you get dressed in the jersey, and sleep well the night before, but these things aren't strictly necessary for the virtue of going to the game. 
Now let's look at acts opposed to the virtue. Now, there are some uh, acts that are uh, incompatible with the proper act of the virtue. So, for instance, taking your car to the body shop beforehand or going to a three-hour movie, that absolutely excludes going to the game. We also find an act that is likely to result in not being able to perform the proper act of the virtue. These would be things like taking a nap at 2.45 p.m. and not setting an alarm, or going to dinner at a sit-down restaurant at 2.45 p.m. If you do these things, you probably won't be able to do the proper act of the virtue, namely going to the game. Finally, we find a group of acts, which are the acts that diminish the proper act of the virtue, but don't entirely impede that proper act. For instance, leaving your wallet at home before leaving for the football game means that you're not going to be able to buy a beer or a hot dog there. Likewise, pulling an all-nighter before the game means you might not have a good time because you might have a headache. So we have these different sets of actions which are all related to the virtue, either as opposed to it, as acts of the virtue, or as entirely unrelated. Okay, so what does all of this have to do with the distinction between mortal and venial sins? Let's first look at the acts of the virtue. Acts of the virtue are either the proper act to which the virtue inclines us, something needed for the proper act, or something that improves the proper act or makes it more pleasant. This is something we went over on the last slide. Likewise, acts that are incompatible with the proper act of the virtue and acts uh, that are likely to result in not being able to perform the proper act are mortal sins. That's because they are contrary to the proper act of the virtue or something necessary for the proper act of the virtue. On the other hand, acts that diminish but don't entirely impede the proper act of the virtue are non-mortal sins, that is, venial sins, because they're not strictly contrary to the proper act of the virtue, but make the proper act or what is needed for it less pleasant or more difficult. Sins that are not mortal are called venial. Venial comes from the Latin word for forgivable, implying that venial sins are small sins, not grave sins. Now, mortal sins are called grave sins or serious sins. The words serious and grave are different ways of designating the same thing, namely mortal sins, but venial sins are forgivable sins because they're smaller. Now, what are we to make of acts that are unrelated to virtue? So far, we've seen that acts of virtue are the ones which are the proper act of the virtue itself, something necessary for it, or something that improves it. And we've also seen that mortal sins are those that are incompatible with the proper act of the virtue, or which are likely to result in not being able to do the proper act of the virtue because they're contrary to something necessary for it. On the other hand, we've also seen that acts which diminish the proper act of the virtue but which aren't entirely incompatible with it are venial sins. What are we to do with acts which are unrelated to the virtue? In answering this question, there are two options. The first option is this. If it's the case that our ultimate end consists in one chief good, such as philosophical wisdom, which is supplemented by a, low, a, a bundle of lower goods, for instance, good looks, a family, pleasant vacations, etc., then doing something unrelated to the chief good in which happiness consists is not a venial sin. 
That's because such an action, even if not ordered to that chiefly in which happiness consists, is still ordered to overall happiness. That is, it's still ordered to the general nature of happiness, even if it's not ordered towards the chief thing in which happiness consists. Now again, all of this is on the assumption of this option, namely that our ultimate end consists in a chief good, but also in a bundle of lower goods. On the other hand, if we deny that assumption and go with a different assumption, namely that happiness consists in one chief good, which is not supplemented or improved at all by any lower goods, then pursuing lower goods that are not ordered towards the highest good is a venial sin, because it implies an imperfection in the ordering of our actions. Now, if our ultimate end is imperfect happiness, that is, natural human happiness, then situation one is correct, since although our chief good is a philosophical life of contemplation, other things besides philosophical contemplation can make that life more pleasant. On the other hand, if our ultimate goal is perfect happiness, that is, immediate supernatural union with God himself, then two is correct, since nothing unrelated to God can improve our possession of God in heaven. Thus, we'd have to say that acts unrelated to the, the chief virtue are venial sins.